The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. In the next uh, 12 minutes or so, I would like to give you my perspective of the research and development at Urbana about the relationship between moment and deflection. And I say moment, not load. One has to be very careful about it. I want to talk, start talking about Professor Talbot, whom I did not appreciate when I was a graduate student because he didn't express himself mathematically. But later on, I understood that the man was very wise and started a tradition at Urbana that was followed all the way until even now. Uh, he actually came from a small town west of Chicago, a farming town. Uh, after he had finished high school, he taught there for about four years then came down to Urbana where there was essentially a junior college of technology. And, and having finished it, he went back into the railroad industry, worked there for about four years to return to Urbana and really build the Department of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics and Civil Engineering. He was, I think, in my <laughs> retrospect, a brilliant man. Uh, and also a family man. You see him there with his three daughters and a son-in-law and, and wife. Uh, I think his legacy to us, uh, his legacy to us was very simple. He said, observation without preconception. And I must uh, confess to you that it's a very difficult thing to do. I. <laughs> Something that was happening in front of my eyes, uh, that, for example, the drift of reinforced concrete systems to ground motion is virtually independent of strength. That <laughs> took me years to figure out because I had a different concept in mind. Uh, I was more preoccupied with the relationship between moment and deformation <laughs> that would be used to, pre quote, predict uh, what was going on. And think about it yourself, is whether you can see something that you didn't think about before. And this man said, you want observation without preconception. Uh, he did a lot of testing in reinforced concrete for the railroad industry, and he always had the loads at the third points. It was sort of a mystic act in Urbana to load things with a constant uh, moment uh, region. But look, after testing dozens of beams, look at what he says. And of course, he knows theory. It's come from Germany. He's quite familiar with it. Uh, but he generalizes like this. In beams with the metal reinforcement small enough in amount not to develop the full compression strength of the concrete, he's talking about under-reinforced beams. And you know, he defined under-reinforced, balanced, and over-reinforced. And then the maximum load is reached or nearly reached when the metal is stretched to its yield point, in words. And the load at the yield point of the metal may well be considered the full strength of the beam, may well be considered the full strength of the beam and the resisting moment at this point may well be calculated by ASFSJD, he says. But please notice, huh? he doesn't give it to you in an exact formula. He gives it in a way that captures the fuzz uh, that you would expect in tests. Now, 
he was interested in the limiting strength, but somehow he didn't pay much attention to the limiting deformation. It was one of his many brilliant students, uh, Dr. Jensen, that sort of put things together. And frankly, uh, those of you who are in the teaching or research business, I recommend that you look at that old bulletin 345 that you can download from the University of Illinois uh, location very easily and for virtually nothing. Uh, now, Jensen said concrete in compression looks something like that. Uh, it was a turning around because suddenly concrete was not linear, uh, it was nonlinear. And he talks about the limiting strain being as much as seven times the strain at maximum stress. But never fear, his maximum stress strain uh, was on the order of not, not two. Uh, so it wasn't very much, but what he said was quite Im important. Uh, he said that considerable error, whatever he meant by considerable, it's like significant, you never know what it means. Uh, considerable error in estimating the compressive strength of the concrete has little effect on the estimated strength of a beam which fails by tension in the steel. I, I mean, that was very wise, but he still put things together mathematically. And that's why he was not worried about defining concrete as being elastic plastic. And in his time, plastic or plasticity had the same buzz word feeling as resilient or other words we use uh, these days. He limited, now, but you must understand, huh? in his times, 4,000 PSI would be considered ultra high strength concrete. Uh, so, but he limited the limiting strain to something like not, not three, going down to not, not two when you reach 4,000, which he didn't think about using. But now one should be very careful about saying something was being done for the first time because it's always possible that somebody else had done it. But he had an elegant way of solving uh, the equation for finding the flexural strength of a beam by plotting stress versus strain and using the idealized stress strain curve for the steel, including strain hardening, and then using the relationship that he obtained from the properties of the section on the basis of, of course, what he assumed, and say, this is the solution. I think it's an elegant way to express it, even though if Talbot had seen it, he would have said, hey, buddy, look at it. This thing can be here or there, and this line can be up there or down here. But uh, when there are two lines, things look much better, I think. <laughs> and he was sensitive to deflection. And this, too, I think is an elegant way of expression. Deflection in terms of role. This is the balanced role, as you would guess, where the limiting deflection and the <coughs> uh, yield deflection are the same. But from there on, he thought that the limiting deflection could be, uh, what, uh, six times the yield deflection. That was easy for him to do. You know why? Because he went by Talbot's mystic principle he used third point loading. Uh, I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Uh, then comes Dr. Newmark, Nathan Newmark, who was simply one of the most brilliant people I've known. Uh, he used to solve problems without knowing how he did it. A tremendous instinct. Uh, I must tell you this. After the Denali earthquake, it turned out that the pipeline that he had helped design uh, slipped some nine feet and he had allowed 10 feet. And people said, oh my God, he must have known uh, that it was going to slip nine feet. 
I didn't think so. If he had known it was going to slap nine feet, he would have done 27 feet. Uh, he always multiplied what he guessed by pi uh, to, to go to a uh, real limit. But, uh, but at that time, he and Chet were working on under the table research related to the war effort. This is in the 40s. We never know what they did, but they had a sensitivity to ductility, huh? because Nate was explaining everything in terms of ductility, which was the ratio of the limiting deflection to the yield deflection. And they did the same thing. Uh, they loaded beams at the third points and got what they wanted. You know, they had the preconception of an elastoplastic response, and with the third point loading, they had it, and they generalized it. All they were interested at that time was explosions and ductility. And I love it. Initially, uh, they, but look, you know, I think as one of you mentioned earlier, unit curvature doesn't exist, right? It has units of one over length. You have to multiply it by a length to bring it to this world. Well, first, they did it by assuming that the curve, unit curvature at yield would be someplace around here. And hey, it was reasonable, but it did not make sense when you thought of the elastoplastic curve. But hey, uh, Nate was always a person who <laughs> made compromises when he saw reality in front of him. That was their first assumption. The second one was simpler. They said, forget about V sub Y. We'll just bring it here and go up. That too defied mechanics, but so what? And then they found out that this didn't give enough deflection. So what did they do? They zipped up here, which turns everything on its head. But hey, it worked. And that was what was important. Then they made, I think, the mistake of testing beams with a concentrated load, uh, in which case it became a little bit difficult to say that the response was elastic plastic because the maximum load was a good 25%, 30% higher uh, than the yield moment. But there again, they were interested in ductility. They had the ductility, and they said, forget about that part of the curve. We'll just <laughs> calculate it uh, like it is. Next. Then there was that famous trade war between the Portland Cement Association and AISC with respect to earthquake resistance. Uh, you see, during the war, the steel industry slept and the concrete industry because they could sell all the steel that they had. And the concrete industry started building bridges. And when they saw this, the steel industry got up and said, we got to beat the concrete people. And they found out that concrete was a brittle element. And indeed, you know, when you compress concrete, it can be quite brittle. So, uh, Chetsis and Ned Burns tested a series of beams, in which case it was impossible to deny uh, that if the yield capacity was here, the limiting capacity was some, in this case, 40% uh, higher. But all that the Portland Cement Association wanted was ductility. Uh, so they made their calculations on the basis of that, that was enough. Then comes Jim into the picture. And he is also looking for a solution to the earthquake problem. He designs a specimen that simulates a joint. You've seen this several times. A column low under axial loading and two essentially cantilevered columns that are moved back and forth, very much like it would happen in a frame in the earthquake. He measures nothing that looks like an elastoplastic system. 
And he says, this is the way to generalize it, against all preconception. It gets worse. May I have the next one, please? Uh, some, who was it? Was Mary Bat talking about confirming linear strain distribution? You've got to tell me where you did that. I've never seen it in reinforced concrete systems when you load them. Uh, but you ask Jim, is the strain distribution linear? He said, no. Uh, is unit curvature a measured ability? He said, no. Does RC respond elastoplastically? He said, no. Uh, is concrete compressive strain limited to 004? He said, no. He destroyed the whole preconception field. And in a way, he was a good descendant of Arthur Newell Talbot. And it was a triumph of observation free of preconception. Now, that's my first compliment. The second one is even more important. He measured strains very carefully. One bunch of punch, please. He plotted the measured strain over the yield strain in the vertical axis and the applied deflection over the yield deflection in the horizontal action. And he measured that if a beam reaches its yield deflection, then there is a substantial increase in strain without hardly any deflection increase. Uh, so that this represented the flat top portion of the stress strain curve, which disappeared into thin air. And I would like to submit to you that had Jim been in physics for that measurement alone, he would have had a Nobel Prize. I assure you. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you.